time with Drs. Scott and Ellen Antoine, and I'm really excited to be here with you guys today to talk about how to support our kids with PANS and PANDAS specifically as we go through um, the upcoming coronavirus outbreaks that we're surely going to see in the next couple of weeks. And we want to just hopefully um, instill some calm uh, as we go through this. And, and you know, unfortunately, as you know, Dr. Ellen and Scott and I were just talking about, there still are a lot of unknowns, but we're going to try to help guide you and ask you, um, talk to you about what we do know and what we um, think we can do to support your kids. Um, so, hey, Scott and Ellen, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. So, um, I, what I'm going to do first, I actually uh, am going to try to share this to my groups, but um, yeah. Scott yeah. and Ellen are amazing functional medicine practitioners, have a background in ER, um, busy, busy in the ER, and Scott just you just left the ER, right? I think maybe good time. In November, that's right. Yeah. November, um, but um, can you tell us about your practice in Carmel, Indiana, and really how you became Pans and Pandas, and what inspired you to start your 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 group, your page, um, Healing Pans and Pandas? So you can find them on Healing Pans and Pandas on Facebook and on Instagram, the Panda Stocks. So tell us your story. Yeah. So. We're both ER docs, as you mentioned, um, board certified in emergency medicine. I started doing functional integrative medicine back and opened our practice, Fine Healthcare, back in 2011. And in 2014, our daughter had a dramatic change in behavior. She developed severe OCD and hand washing was her obsessive behavior, uh, compulsive behavior, and um, she had food restrictions and we had no idea what was going on right like because that's not something we were treating and here we were already taking good care of ourselves eating great and it was really really scary and it made us you know dive into the books and start figuring out what was wrong with our daughter and sadly no one in our area believed in it uh nobody in our area had any expertise, any answers, and um, so I ended up taking her to New York and getting some different treatments between New York and Chicago, and miraculously, she's doing amazing, and, you know, but people start, you know, they hear that story, and they start saying, hey, you know, I think my child might have what your daughter had, and so, you know, it just gives you such a passion. It's like pants and pandas, moms and dads, it's like no other illness, like you just have you know, life changes in a moment. So that's what really started it. And then, you know, we've really developed into a practice where we see those kids and those families and help support them. Yeah, that's that's um, so, um, so needed because even for me here in the Bay Area where we have the Stanford Pants Clinic, um, still there are many Bay Area practitioners who um, maybe, um, maybe they believe in it, but, you know, Still are skeptical and maybe and often don't believe that this particular child in front of them doesn't have it. So it's it's so so needed to have this information out there. And Scott, you just had this incredible victory in the Indiana legislature. And um, before we start really diving into the topic, I really you know this is such a huge win for patients and families uh, in Indiana and something that I hope we can replicate in pretty in every state legislature. So can you tell our audience about that? Sure. So uh, as many of you know, one of the treatments commonly needed in some children with PANS and PANDAS is intravenous immune globulin called IVIG. And we don't quite know exactly how that works. We believe it remove some of the abnormal immune complexes in children with pans and pandas and just slows down their brain reactivity. And really for children who need it, it can be life changing. The problem is because pandas and pans are controversial diagnosis, most insurance companies, if they even see pans or pandas written on the chart anywhere, they immediately will deny authorization for IVIG. And so what happens is a lot of these parents end up being really desperate. We've seen parents sell their car, or sell their home, yeah. try and save up money because the average cost for IVIG is probably somewhere between fifteen and twenty-five thousand dollars a treatment. And so there are about five states currently where the states have made laws saying that insurance companies cannot die, uh, deny coverage just based on the diagnosis of pans and pandas. And so there was a legislative effort put forth in Indiana to get the same type of law, because I'll say that 
I had some children who we determined ultimately needed IVIG, and there were some parents I suggested move across the border to Illinois because Illinois had one of these laws. And so yeah. fortunately, one of our state senators and a few Panda's parents got together and wrote this law, this bill, I should say. And I had the great privilege of testifying before the Indiana Senate uh, Subcommittee on Insurance. Uh, ultimately was called back by uh, the House Subcommittee and asked some additional questions. And just this past week, uh, we had approval of this bill. So now it'll go to the governor and it'll be signed. So soon children here in Indiana uh, will not have coverage denied based on the diagnosis of PANS and PANDAS. And we've had other states contacting me about uh, speaking and hopefully getting involved in their process. And they've copied some of the language in our bill. So hopefully they'll be successful. That is amazing. And you know, if you guys want to hear Scott's testimony, just go to the Facebook page, Healing Pans and Pandas, and you can listen to the testimony. And I hope that um, will give some inspiration to parents and other practitioners in, in I mean, all the other states that need this legislation, uh, including California. And so, you know, hopefully we can finally get kids with pans and pandas some of the care they need, including IVIG. Right. Yeah. Um, I see a bunch of people on with us. It's yeah. awesome. We have 103 people. So, you know, if you're just coming on, we're talking about really how to help our kids with pans and pandas navigate and our and our parents, right? The the parents of kids with pans and pandas navigate this this pretty scary time right now as we're kind of holding our breath, waiting for the coronavirus pandemic to really hit in full force. I know for you know me in California, you know we uh, I, I just had read yesterday that Governor Newsom might be restricting uh, gatherings of larger than ten, um, and our schools have shut down. And um, we're all here. I, I just asked before we went live. If Ellen and Scott heard me yelling at the kids, <laughs> I was telling them to you know shush, and you know they're just even just one day home, right? They're a little bit stir, stir crazy, but you know, please, if you're coming on, tag a friend, a parent, a practitioner you know who could benefit from this conversation. So, you know, as we really um, talk about um, PANS and PANDAS and COVID-19, um, mm -hmm. one of the things that I've been telling parents to try to reassure them is that it does seem that the vast majority of patients in general have mild illness, maybe upwards of 80%. Um, or more, and many, many are going to be asymptomatic. I mean, I, I am just waiting for when I can actually have more test kits in my office because I just imagine that many people coming in with very mild cold symptoms probably have it. And if we knew who had it, we could help contain and mitigate, you know, the the the, the spread a little bit more effectively. Um, but then, of course, we hear that the the people who are uh, more at risk for complications like sepsis and, and even dying um, are those who are elderly and those with chronic health conditions. And, and I've been getting a lot of questions from families, not just of kids with pans and pandas, but you know, with Hashimoto's or you know other autoimmune illnesses or asthma. Um, you know whether or not their kids are more vulnerable and how scared they should be. So, um, what do you think? I mean, what should we be telling our, our families out there? That's a great question. Um, you know, the bottom line is uh, no one can say definitively for sure. I think it's reasonable to assume that, you know, these children, by virtue of what they have, have an abnormal immune response. And so I know in your practice and our practice as well, when you test these children, many of them ending up, end up having low immunoglobulins and frequent infections. And so that would certainly put them at a high risk group. Uh, we know our other autoimmune patients who are on immunosuppressive medications, although not specifically spoken about uh, in the media and in the, by the medical authorities, obviously are at higher risk. So I think it's reasonable to assume that these children, because they have an abnormal immune response, may be at more risk for a worse outcome or be at risk, obviously, for a flare. We know in PANS, yeah. uh, there are a lot of things, yeah. even just close contacts without an obvious problem. And, you know, stress is high. People are kind of uh, locked at home. So that's certainly a possibility. You know, I was uh, thinking before and I saw an interesting post by a mom of a child with pandas and it said, you know, kind of now the rest of the world knows how we feel. You know, this great unknown. We're kind yeah. of secluded yeah. to our house. We're concerned about infections, uh, all those types of things. We're concerned about what people eat and they put into their body. So it's, uh, it, it does seem, and I hope it fosters some more uh, empathy for parents who have gone through this, who themselves self sequester their children or don't have a whole lot of social interaction. I just hope, I always think that uh, I want something good to come out of it, any crisis. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, our daughter is healed and great, but she's at risk. Um, you know, her immune system's not perfect and she's 18 years old and she doesn't show any of those typical signs and symptoms, but we decided to not send the kids to school this last Friday because, um, you know, we just didn't want that potential exposure. And, you know, even though schools didn't close until they're not closed officially till this Monday, that was one of the decisions we made for our family was to keep the kids home this past Friday because we just don't know. Yeah, yeah. And I do think, you know, when we're talking about patients um, who are more vulnerable and you look at the list of patients with diabetes or heart disease or cancer, um, that really is going to, I think, people, you know, patients who are more, you know, quote, immunosuppressed. And so, you know, in terms of our kids with pans and pan, it's sort of, uh, yes, as, as Dr. Scott pointed out, I mean, there's, there are some kids who do have low IgG levels, antibody levels, and maybe, you know, more uh, immuno, uh, less immunocompetent, I should say. Um, but then there are some kids who don't have that as an issue. And so um, I think for us, we just don't know. And so that's what we want to be here to really try to see how can we support our kids as much as possible to really keep their immune systems balanced during this time. Sure. Um, and, and as Dr. Ellen pointed out, you know, with the school issue, you know, a lot of schools have already, have already closed down. Our schools in St. Carlos here just announced, literally on Friday, we got the announcement, you know, during school hours that Friday was going to be the last day. Um, and kids got, you know, sent home with piles of books, and, um, you know, uh, a discussion of, of, you know, likely starting online learning next week. Um, but some schools haven't closed down yet. Uh, I know as of today, March 14, my sister who's in New Jersey said that the, the Manhattan schools have not yet closed down. So what would you tell parents of kids with pans and pans if their school districts have not yet made plans to close down? So I would say, I mean, it's really a personal decision and we just don't know. But like I mentioned, our personal choice was mm -hmm. to keep our kids home because the risk seems really great, particularly for these kids that aren't immunocompetent like everybody else. And um, I don't think anybody knows. I don't think there's, you know, if you choose for your family to send your child to school, I'm not sure that's the worst decision either. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, in a lot of these things, it ends up being a personal decision for us. I think the, the wisest choice for us was, you know, we have five kids and four of them are still home with us, one's in college. And we decided not just to keep our daughter home, but to keep the siblings home as well to decrease yeah. the risk. Sure. And, we, you know, what I always tell parents, it's there's obviously a lot of questions that come up when I see uh, when we see these children with, with pans and pandas and parents are worried they end up having a, um, you know, uh, they end up having a plan, educational plan with their school to work out some of the issues their children have with going to school. Um, and I P or, or what have you. And, you know, I always tell the parents it's usually grade school, middle school, maybe early high school for most of the children we're seeing. And I always tell them that they're, we'll make this up. It'll be okay. You know, if they miss time, I can write a note. We can do some things to kind yeah. of help support them. I'm certainly happy to do that in the midst of this and just say, probably not my recommendation. They would go to a school. I always kind of look at it and think, what, what would we do for our children? And we were faced yeah. with this on Thursday. And, that's the decision we made. So we're, we're grateful the school closed and is doing some online learning so they don't fall behind or yeah. miss a semester. Yeah. But. yeah, and I have to say, you know, we, we weren't sure, you know, with the San Carlos School District and San Mateo County Health, um, San Carlos was really looking closely at the guidance from the San Mateo County Health Department. And um, we just didn't know if the schools were gonna close down. We were seeing all these other school districts closing down starting this Monday. Um, but Peter and I had that discussion and actually on Friday, I started writing a letter, uh, an email to the t uh, their teachers, Kenzie and Bodie's teachers, and the principal letting them know that as of Monday, I was gonna keep the kids home. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then about, you know, literally probably as I was typing, the letter went out uh, to the whole school saying that the decision was made to close. So um, I, I think, you know, just just now 
especially because we are really at the stage where they're expecting numbers to be doubling very rapidly. Um, the more we can do to keep ourselves safe and also not you know, expose our children either. I think that, um, again, I think children tend to do better in all, the, in all of the um, studies that have come out so far. Um, but you know, if you are still working in your office, I would also really consider for this chunk of time, if you have a child with pans or pandas or you know, immune compromise in any way, um, to really consider working from home, right. right? Or taking the time off because it doesn't do much good to keep your kids at home and then go out into the real world and possibly bring it back yourself, right? right? Um, I don't unfortunately have that luxury right now because I, I'm a, also you know, I a functional right. medical pediatrician, but also a primary care pediatrician. So um, we are continuing with visits and um, right. and uh, and you know sick visits and well care. Um, although many families are choosing to postpone their well care, as I probably would <laughs> during this time. Right. I mean, the last place you want to be right now is the doctor's office or the ER if you can help it, right? That's what we're telling people too, is, you know, if you can avoid going to the emergency department or certainly to our office, because we don't do sick care, you know, it's, it's just mm -hmm. not the place to be right now. Right. You yeah. Yeah. So I have a lot of outings, right? Yeah. right? So I have a lot of colleagues, obviously, that still work in the emergency department here in Indianapolis. I'm also on the mailing list uh, of the American College of Emergency Physicians. So we're getting reports from people all over the country about what's going on. And a lot of ERs now are developing an outdoor type approach, even though it's still kind of cold here in Indiana, um, <laughs> setting up tents and things and basically having a triage that says, you come if you have no symptoms, you're dismissed if you have any symptoms suggestive of COVID, you're swabbed if you look fine, you're sent home, self-quarantine till the results are back 12, 24 hours. If you're sick, then you get inside the hospital. So terminal cleaning in hospital rooms is taking a long time yeah. uh, and hospitals are really overwhelmed and i can tell people what we've told our patients and other people is there are no hospitals i know of that are doing uh i just want to feel better testing they're it's just not they don't have enough uh test kits and so they're being really selective in what they're doing the reality is most mild cases and what even we would see in children uh, those children would probably do fine at home yeah so you know, I'm trying to ease people's minds and say, look, this is a bit of a scary thing going on. And, you know, I'm glad we're doing this uh, Facebook Live because I think it's important to tell people, look, get a cup of coffee, relax, sit with us, spend some time. Let's see if we can put your mind at ease. So uh, I think it's really important to do that. So I'm glad we're getting this chance to do this. Now with the testing, so as Scott said, I mean, testing is still not widely available. And I think that is a huge, huge problem. Um, even in my office, you know, we really don't have the capability, you know, Quest and LabCorp did roll out their testing. Um, I ordered test kits to come, you know, to the office and Quest does not have an ETA for when we'll get those. And even then they're limiting me to, uh, to 30. Um, so even then we're having to decide who gets tested. And unfortunately, um, we know that many, many people are going to have mild symptoms or asymptomatic or be asymptomatic and not meet the criteria for testing. So that is a problem because Emily writes, you know, people are, are asymptomatic and, and could be bringing COVID-19 home, right? Which right. You, unfortunately Absolutely. could be. What's the best autoimmune protocol to have your kiddo on? So we're gonna, um, we're gonna talk about that, right? Because that's really what we wanna focus on today is what can we do as preventatively as possible, supporting our kids' immune systems, knowing that they have this autoimmune predisposition. Um, the first thing is really, you know, I mean, they write good hygiene. I mean, absolutely, right? That's that's the first thing. And I know, um, you know, when we look at, at how many times adults touch their faces in an hour, I'm actually very impressed. I've been watching Ellen and Scott. They haven't touched their faces yes. once. <laughs> After you, made, after you wrote a post about that recently, I was like, oh, yeah, we have to be kind of mind because we just do it so much. But I mean, on average, 23 times an hour, 23 times an hour, right? And then you imagine your kids, right? I mean, I, I know, you know, especially Bodhi's over there listening, but I know he is constantly you know touching his face his mouth right. his hands. so anyhow that that's the first thing and, and of course some of our kids you know with hands and pandas they they will have some ocds to touch their faces and compulsions and so that can be even more challenging so making sure that we're just focusing on washing uh, our hands with soap and water 30 seconds um, if you don't have access to running water and soap a hand sanitizer with at least 60 percent alcohol is really important because that's what's been found minimum of 60 percent to kill coronavirus on surfaces um, and you know 
like tables and you know laptops and all that and and your hand um, I have a post on um, because of course you can't buy Purell right now or right. you can't find it um, you actually it's really hard to find aloe too and rubbing alcohol yeah. but yeah that may be a little easier to find uh, but I wrote a, a blog post on how to make a 60 percent um, alcohol-based hand sanitizer using the different kinds of isopropyl rubbing alcohol that you can find 99% 91% 70% and the different ratios with aloe now if you don't can't find aloe you can use glycerin um, but it's really important um, but apart from that because again we also know that some kids will develop OCDs around washing too so that was what I was just gonna yeah. say a little hard because you do have to have that comfort. We had to, you know, when my daughter was her sickest, we had to lock up soap in our house because she washed her hands to the point that they bled. Yeah. So it, it's having appropriate communication with your kid and explaining, you know, they have these fears of contamination. So having, you know, an appropriate conversation about what is an appropriate amount of time to wash your hands, what does that look like, also needs to happen because yeah. you can go the other direction, which becomes mm -hmm. challenging. You know, wash your hands, but don't be afraid. <laughs> you know things so you know that that becomes a balancing act for many of these kids um yes, so we just have absolutely. to be careful with that languaging and and speak honestly with our kids but not incite fear so that they are now obsessing about washing their hands that's also right. i'm glad you mentioned washing your hands first uh because i think that's most important there's been at least one study i know that looked at washing hands as compared to uh, you know people have a tendency to think the alcohol-based hand sanitizer works better and actually soap may yeah. actually yeah. remove things better and so i'm glad that you mentioned yeah. that first and that may put people's mind at ease because i think you can still find soap uh in <laughs> <laughs> right yeah i mean we have our costco size from i mean probably months ago that huge you know package of um dove soap and so we didn't right. even need to buy any more <laughs> right <laughs> now, in terms of you know Emily's question, what what other protocols can we do, right? Because of course hygiene is number one. Um, but what else have you been recommending to to your families in terms of supporting uh, kids' immune systems who have pans and pandas? Is that me or so? Uh, so I think we kind of take the the same approach no matter what um, we're treating. Kind of first trying to identify what's going on, whether it could be, I think the first identification question is, are the children sick or not? And certainly anyone who's having trouble breathing or blew around the lips or to their fingertips, obviously, or can't stop vomiting, those are children that should end up in the emergency department. But then beyond that, uh, we're identifying, trying to identify other uh, things that are adversely affecting health. And I feel like it's almost preaching of the choir because a lot of your audience and our audience as well are already doing a lot of these things, a lot of these pans and pandas parents are very yeah. vigilant about addressing diet addressing those things so we try and identify stresses things that might be adversely affecting their health including inflammatory foods uh, things like that and uh, reduce those things yeah and then we move on from there and try and look at things that we can optimize so we've been really clear in messaging um that you know there's no cure for this there's been a lot of marketing people have been doing around cures and things and there really just isn't a well-proven cure either anecdotally or in the literature but there are so many things that we we do i know you do elisa with you and your children and your husband um but these are things we do every day to boost our immune system and really we look at you know optimizing detoxification and those are some things that ellen likes to talk about that and supporting the immune system so our approach that Scott's talking about that we apply with all of our patients, we call it fully functional, right? To be your most healthy, productive, and joy-filled. So identifying what those things are. And I would say stress is actually a big one here. So when we talk about the immune system, we know in science, it's clear that, you know, stress has a negative impact on our health. So, so let's not downplay that. Like we need to be you know, ourselves calm when we're talking with our kids about this, but also, you know, understand that our kids have a lot more stress, particularly our kids with pants and pandas than, uh, than other kids. And so, you know, looking at ways to reduce even the stress response is huge. You know, we could add, we could talk, and we will talk about supplements and other things to do, but if there are strategies to employ with your kids, and, you know, I've talked recently about four, seven, eight breathing, because I think it's so easy to do. So I recommend to all my patients, young and old, that they start doing some mindful breathing exercises to reduce the stress response in the body, which will have a positive impact on their immune system. So four, seven, eight breathing is breathe in for a count of four seconds, 
hold your breath for a count of seven seconds and breathe out slowly over a count of eight seconds. And that's actually kind of fun to do with your kids and have them practice doing that. So that's an easy stress reducer. Again, Scott talked about reducing pro-inflammatory foods. So we talk about sugar as one of them. And you know, people are racing to the grocery stores and buying quick and easy foods off the shelves. But the more you can get whole foods into your child and yourself, the better off your immune system is going to be. So that's you know, just eating all the colors of the rainbow as much as you can get your hands on mm-hmm. fresh vegetables right now. But optimizing our natural detox processes. So that's our third step of becoming fully functional. Make sure you hydrate, okay? And we encourage people to hydrate with half their body weight and fluid ounces of water per day. Mm-hmm. I like dry brushing as a way to stimulate lymphatic system. And I have a blog post on our uh, website, you know, for how to dry brush and stimulate lymphatics. Also, hot, cold showers do that too. Um, soaking in a magnesium salt bath is a way to help not only support detoxification, but super relaxing for kids and throw a little lavender oil in there. So that's another great thing to be able to do. Make sure your kids moving their bowels regularly. And then when we talk about support, specific things to support the immune system, we can talk about, you know, different nutrients and vitamin C is probably the top well, of the list right now. Let's right there before we go into, sure. into supplements, okay? Because I can't underscore enough um, what Scott and Ellen are saying that, you know, the foundations really are your diet and lifestyle. Those are the foundations. You cannot out supplement a crappy diet and a crappy lifestyle. I mean, there's, right. we sure. will not be able to support your kids' immune systems as much as possible if we don't have those foundations. And it, you know, it sounds simplistic and in a way, yeah, it is simple in concept. It's not always easy, right? Because we right. know that many of our kids with hands and pants are not sleeping well, but that is a priority. Um, right. Right. I can't emphasize enough. You got to get rid of the sugar. We've had many conversations um, and with Kenzie and Bodie, <laughs> and they know that right now sugar's off the table, right? right? You know, we're not having dessert. We're not having juice. We're not. I mean, Kenzie's watching me right now, right? <laughs> um, we are. We, that is off the table, right? What did I say? We're not getting at the grocery store. We're not getting ice cream, right? <laughs> um, because sugar, I mean, has been found to reduce the ability of your white blood cells, particular Mm -hmm. cells called macrophages that literally like eat up viruses and bacteria, um, reduce their function by, you know, maybe up to 50%. And that effect lasts for up to five hours after consuming that sugary food. And we don't want to think of sugar as just what what we might think of, like I just said, ice cream, but um, juice, I mentioned juice, juice should be out too, right? Um, And then stress, I mean, the stress response. And you know, we talk about as functional medicine practitioners that that um, the mindfulness, the meditation, the breathing. But yeah. this is not to just be zen, right? right. This is literally <laughs> at That's a that. cellular physiologic level to support our immune system, support our adrenals, reduce inflammatory cytokines. All of that has been measured. Right yeah. with the the four seven eight breathing belly breathing some people call it right the diaphragmatic breathing but I would not um, put that into a category of well I'll get to it when I want to right I because agree. it's really important and we know that for kids with um, with uh, with pans and pandas cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the cornerstones of treatment mm-hmm. so I'm going to point to and I'll put these I'll put these um, uh, Emily's saying that her kids are making faces about no sweets, but yeah. <laughs> sorry, no I was better news. <laughs> um, but um, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, is a cornerstone of treatment for our kids with pans and pandas. And there are two books that I would really, really encourage uh, parents to to get if you haven't already. So Dawn Hebner, she spells it H U E B N E R. She's a child psychologist. I actually just did an interview uh, with her on, on, you know, how to talk to kids about coronavirus. Mm-hmm. Amazing. And she teaches kids or these self-help books for kids and teenagers on how to overcome various emotional, you know, ailments or blocks, whatever you want to call them, using CBT. Mm-hmm. And so her book, um, What to Do When You Worry Too Much, is amazing. Uh, it's meant for kids maybe, you know, probably – like 12 and under. And then for older kids who want to know, understand a little bit more about what's going on in their brain, um, teenagers, preteens, she has a book, Overcoming Worry. So I would absolutely 
um, get those or workbooks for kids and teenagers to do do it with them. Um, I also like to give kids and parents really a concrete uh, you know, tools. So the four, seven, eight breathing is concrete, right? Because if we wouldn't be good doctors if we just said, go out and breathe, right. <laughs> or go out and meditate, right? You'd be like, okay, but how? And so um, there's an app on the phone. It's called Oak, like the Oak tree mm -hmm. and it's a breathing app and you mm -hmm. can do it with your, your kids. Um, I have a, a 12 year old um, who loves using it. And in fact, he's the one who taught me about it. And so, um, so, you know, using all of our tools so that not just our kids, but us as parents, that we can also reduce our inflammatory levels through stress reduction. And that's going to keep us all healthier because, I mean, we, I mean, really, Lord only knows how much fear and stress is out there right now. So that that is one of the most important things, I think, to reduce our susceptibilities to um, severe illness. I think that if you look at, in adults at least, the uh, data on who's sickest and who's not doing well, obviously older folks, because their immune system is, is impaired, but also uh, male smokers who are overweight. Yeah. So I really look at this, not just with our children, but with our adult patients, you know, as an opportunity to really turn things around, because even if folks do get sick, they're going to do a lot better if they are healthier at the outset. Yeah. So I think that's great. I want to just talk about one other thing that I think is a practical thing. It's not free, like breathing, but um, heart math. <laughs> yeah. Heart <laughs> math really, is amazing. I love heart math. You know, what's the, the little um, probe or whatever it is, the little... Um, I'm going to be sure that I have it here. Um, that is what, $150, $160, and it's biofeedback. It's... it's um, breathing related and heart rate variability and what a you know to just be in that place of you know um calm and learning what that breathing looks like i i we have heart math here in the office and often we'll put our kids and patients on the device so they can experience that but it's a really relatively inexpensive thing to purchase for home use that's yeah. fun to do with your kids and yourself and it's also a really practical way to get into that place of uh resonance and good breathing and that's right, um, that's right. so this is what it looks like yeah. i'm going to show you guys um this is the portable one this is meant for your smartphone you can use your iPad, iphone ipad android but it's just a little ear clip that goes on your ear your mm -hmm. lobe if i can find my ear lobe here <laughs> Um, and then you just plug it into your phone and it will pull up. It's called the Inner Balance um, app. And then it literally uh, just, um, you just mm -hmm. breathe with the image going in and out. Yeah, and it's that's cold, that's right? That's it's just, that's that's right. <laughs> just it, you know, you follow it and it, it gives kids instant feedback on whether or not they're in coherence, you know, in yeah, the zone, right. in that place where where their immune system is working optimally, right? right? And so any tool that we can get, and this is, you know, kids love this because it's that immediate immediate feedback right there. Um, and again, it's heart math, um, like, like the subject in school, <laughs> heart math. Um, it's not, um, uh, I think that, that the probe may be $125 and the app, the Inner Balance app is free, so. Um, so definitely, um, I just, there's, there were a couple of questions before we move on to yeah. supplements um, about, I had mentioned juices, right? That we're giving up juices. Um, smoothies, I think are great, but I definitely think smoothies should be more packed with vegetables and fruit. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, juices and smoothies that are just made with fruit, that is a huge sugar load. So um, mm -hmm. really as the base, you want to have a lot of vegetables. Um, a tip I just learned from a, from a patient, I love learning from patients, is that frozen cauliflower doesn't add any taste, really, right? And so, you know, getting in your, your vegetables, um, some fruits, um, healthy fats are really important. Throwing in those nuts and seeds in there, um, coconut oil. I throw in half an avocado, makes it super creamy. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Avocado um, is great. So really, you know, so juices smoothies are not bad per se but again we want to really be heavier on the vegetable side um really lowering our, our sugar load that glycemic index so that uh that we reduce inflammation from that yeah and i tell people when they ask me that question in the office because we promote uh, you know often uh protein smoothies for patients is that they choose non-tropical fruits so the bananas the mangoes the pineapple have a lot more sugar than 
you know, a few berries and apple are part of a pear. And when you get an apple, you don't get the apple that's this big, yeah. right? You get the apple that's this big, and yeah. you know, that's a lot less sugar. So yeah, yeah great yeah. though, lots of veggies. Avocado does make it really smoothie and really adds no additional taste. So mm. it's yeah. nice. Okay, so what about, let's talk about what supplements um, you might be recommending to your patients. Uh, you know, many of your patients are probably already on some really good immune supporting supplements anyway. So it might not necessarily be in addition to what you're already on. I know most of my patients are on some really good immune supporting supplements, but um, but yeah, I mean, I'm excited to have you guys on here because we don't get a chance a lot. I mean, Ellen and Scott and I have been friends for, I don't know, what, four years now? And four years. Mm -hmm in a health group, um, health entrepreneur group together to really bring health information out to the world. And um, we get to meet in person four times a year, which is awesome. That's probably more than I see my family sometimes. <laughs> right. um, but, um, but, uh, but we don't get to powwow a lot about clinical stuff. So I was excited to kind of um, compare notes too and really learn from them. And so um, what supplements um, are you typically recommending during this time in particular? to support mm -hmm. our kids' immune system so that we reduce their susceptibility to serious illness. Because let's face it, at, you know, they're predicting that at some point, 70% of Americans yeah. are gonna have COVID-19, right? It, the chances are that we will get it, but we can make it so that the chances are much more likely that we'll have mild illness, right? So I think that the first thing, obviously, that we had talked about was healthy diet, but then beyond that, um, there's going to be a benefit to increasing the amount of nutrients. You know, a lot of food, even organic food is really over farmed. So the nutrient content in foods over the last probably 30 or 40 years has dropped. And in addition, we all know that from the patients that we see that sometimes they will have a higher amount of certain nutrients needed. So the things that I think we're looking at with our patients, and we were comparing notes earlier. Uh, so we are recommending vitamin C. We are recommending probably a weight-based dose of zinc. Um, these are actually a few things that have been studied in China. There's some reports coming out of China that they're actually using high dose IV vitamin C, which we yeah. have not used in children, yeah. but high dose IV vitamin C along with zinc and then some other uh, medications, traditional medications for malaria and things that they're actually seeing some good results. But so we recommend probably vitamin C under enhancing detox. We would typically recommend glutathione uh, or N-acetylcysteine uh, and what else? Zinc, selenium has mm -hmm. been shown in some literature to be helpful here. Um, you know, uh, we've got some immune supportive herbs and I know there's been some questions and we kind of chatted about this, but I've had some patients ask me about specific things that we would typically recommend in, you know, acute viral situations yeah. like uh, black elderberry or Sambucus. Um, you know, causing some cytokine issues. And, and quite frankly, we just don't know, but we are recommending that in the acute situation for our patients to, um, you know. Well, that's because, because this is a huge topic, the elderberry topic. And also there's questions about NSAIDs and the, you know, coming out of France, the uh, uh, Minister mm -hmm. of Health uh, recommending against immuno suppressants like NSAIDs and prednisone, right, which some of our right. kids will be right. on. So let's, let's table that just for a second, because I want to finish up, like what, how can we support our immune system yeah. And then we can talk about, okay, what if we do get sick? What if our kids do get sick with COVID-19, right? So I, I totally agree. I think, you know, vitamin C is really key. And even some of the studies, uh, well, as Scott mentioned, right, looking at treatment and um, sepsis studies, looking at IV vitamin C to significantly reduce um, morbidity and mortality. So so you had said vitamin C, vitamin D, of course. Yep. Right. Now that people who are uh, deficient in vitamin D, are more likely, uh, maybe at higher risk for developing sepsis and complications. Yeah. And so what I do recommend, if you can, is to actually try to get your vitamin D levels measured, your 25 hydroxy vitamin yeah. D, because Absolutely. I mean, I have so many parents who say they can't be low on vitamin D. They're out in the sun all the time. Of course, we're in the winter right now. Right. Everyone is low, but, um, but it, can, it can be surprising how shockingly low yeah. some kids are and how much they need some to supplement in order to get their levels in the optimal range um, because their body with pans and pan is your immune system is just eating it up. Right. And mm -hmm. so, um, I mean, I, my, my optimal range is really trying to get their levels up to about 
60 to 80. I don't know if you've heard that. That's exactly what we say. Yep. And we know that uh, from, from adults and children that we've seen, if you do genetic studies, there are actually some vitamin D receptor mutations that can cause patients to require a higher amount of, uh, amount of vitamin D. So we have some patients that require more than you would think they required. One of the problems with a lot of the studies that have been done on vitamin D, you know, periodically people will do a study and say, you know, vitamin D doesn't help with asthma or vitamin D doesn't help with this. If you look at the methods of the study, a lot of times they're giving people super small doses and never measuring uh, the vitamin D yes. level. Yes. So you're really not getting an accurate representation. Studies that have shown where they've measured levels and brought levels up even to 30 or 40 have shown significant improvement. There was a prospective study out of Japan where they studied these children as they went into the flu season and found a huge reduction in cases of flu in children that had an adequate amount. And they gave those child children higher amounts of vitamin D than people would normally give safe amounts, but a little bit higher than the RDA. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, vitamin C, vitamin D, glutathione, our master antioxidant, which is really key for not just detoxification, but, um, but you know, really having antiviral properties right. itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, a fish oil, probiotics. We know probiotics, that's, that's what I was right? going to say. Reduce the risk of mm -hmm. and cold. So mm -hmm. those are kind of the, and zinc, right? Zinc yeah. also, zinc supplementation, even just 15, one, five milligrams a day has yeah. been shown in adults to um, reduce the risk of, of infection. So, I mean, those are kind of foundations and your kids may be already on them, but if they're not, look into those. Um, and the selenium, you know, hey, throw throw a couple of Brazil nuts in your smoothie. You know? <laughs> right, that's right. You know? And you get the selenium from Brazil nuts if if they're not taking a you know multi mineral, multivitamin with that in there. And I see we had some one question about are we talking about oral glutathione? Usually, yes. It um, you can get liposomal forms of glutathione. There's at least one I can think of that's kind of watermelon flavored that children seem to like. And um, also, we have compounded topical glutathione especially for children with pans or pandas who were reluctant to swallow or to take yeah. supplements at all, uh, didn't like the texture of the liposomal glutathione and on their tongue. So we've compounded it and had good results with that. Um, I will say, I mean, my, my kids are, you know, the master taste testers. I taste test everything through them. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, they are just not fans of anything liposomal. It's just, it's, Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's hard, but but we do. Well, glutathione is uh, sulfury. Exactly. Glutathione, especially, is very uh, rotten. Eggs. They don't really mask it that well. However, they are fine. Pretty fine. I say fine. They're fine with the the liposomal glutathione. It's a little minty um, by Designs for Health or Quicksilver. Mm -hmm. So I just gave them a spoonful this morning. <laughs> so that I mean that is that's part of our you know, NAC and acetylcysteine, the cysteine being a precursor to glutathione, one of the, the amino acids that makes up glutathione, that's also a reasonable option and great for detoxification and immune support as well. So for yeah. those people that don't tolerate sulfur compounds or the glutathione specifically, NAC is a great option as well. Yes. There was um, a question about whether, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, there was just a question on, on what form of zinc, but were you gonna add something about the glutathione? Well, I was just gonna say um, one of the um, one of the other questions was, can my child just take a multivitamin? I would say that would really depend on what multivitamin it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The multivitamins, if you look at in the store, the ones that we grew up with are kind of little sugary. And if you look, the amounts of things that are in there are really not high enough uh, that you would need. And there's a lot of fillers and chemicals and sugar in them as well. So you have to be really yeah. selective with where you're getting that. Yeah, um, I think sure. that's important. Um, zinc. So I typically use, see, I just touched my face, right? So I typically use zinc um, picolinate or zinc citrate <laughs> um, are probably yeah. the, the most easily absorbed forms and also pretty easy to find too. Yeah, um, they are. And then as far as other things that, that um, We'd spoken about even before we got on, on the line was really what other things and you know what I think about for kids with pans and pandas is you know we know we don't fully understand all the pathophysiology but we do know that teach 17 cytokines right. are implicated that's um in not just pans and pandas but other autoimmune illnesses as well and so what I've been using to really try to um 
uh, help kids modulate their TH17 response, meaning balance it, right? Mm -hmm. so normal, you know, when, when we talk about inflammation, immediately most people's reaction is, oh, inflammation's bad. But we know that inflammation is our body's natural response to a stressor, an injury, an infection, and we need inflammation initially to fight things off, right? Mm -hmm. But when inflammation goes unchecked or, you know, we don't have the the regulatory piece to say, hey, you've done your job, inflammation, let's come on down. That's when we see problems, right? And in, in pans and panis, we know that at least in part it's TH17. So some of the things, and let me know your experience with these, but some of the things that I found to be really helpful to balance that TH17 response. And for our kids with pans and panis, I think that this could be really important during the coronavirus outbreaks is uh, to really help that part of their immune system that has a tendency to overreact really stay more balanced. Um, so, you know, CBD can be very helpful. Yeah. CBD has been found to modulate the TH17 response. Um, right. Tiny skull cap has also been, and I've been using one more tiny skull cap. Um, low dose naltrexone I use in quite a few patients. All the time. Yeah. Um, That's something else that can be compounded. So low dose naltrexone can be compounded because the syrups that I've had made of low dose naltrexone, we have a pretty creative compounding pharmacist, have not always been well received. So you can actually compound uh, through a good compounding pharmacy. Yeah. It's important to find one that's certified compounding pharmacy, uh, International Compounding Pharmacy Association uh, is really helpful. You can do it topically too. You can yeah. do the yeah. topical compounded, nice. right. Yeah. 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 Has, so low do, naltrexone, you know, ha, in low doses, right? When we're talking about low dose right. naltrexone, it really does have to be compounded. So um, right. you want to make sure you're using a certified compounding pharmacy, as Scott said. Um, and then the other thing that I use quite a bit, and I know that some of my families are on um, right now, but um, S SPM, they're called, they're specialized pro-resolving mediators. And you know, up until now, Metagenics was the only company that, um, that had this available, but now Designs for Health has also an, an SPM product. But these specialized pro-resolving mediators, they're not anti-inflammatory. They help support the part of the immune system that should come up and regulate the immune response when inflammation has done its job, which is why I find it so helpful for a lot of kids. And so, again, I think, you know, we don't we're, we're trying to as as physicians here, you know, working with kids with pans and pandas, trying to help you guys sort through what could be helpful for your kids. And I do think that if we can, you know, really get on these diet and lifestyle supports, supplements that will help support the immune system and also uh, support a healthy immune response can be really helpful in preventing serious complications. Absolutely, yeah. And I know there's, uh, we also don't, uh, we use some uh, homeopathics in our, uh, in our practice as well. Probably not as much as you do, Elisa, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, so just one question, Hope asked, what can we give for lung support? Because of course, many records of pans and pandas have asthma too, but you know, Ellen mentioned the NAC and acetylcysteine is really yeah. good for your lungs. Yeah. Um, really good for, uh, for just clearing out mucus in your lungs too. Mm -hmm. um, we found in patients with asthma, they tend to have lower levels of glutathione, magnesium, and selenium in their lungs. Mm -hmm. so all the things that we're talking about, we actually right. didn't magnesium, but- Magnesium, 80% of the population is deficient in magnesium. So um, I do love magnesium for all yeah. my patients. I would also say even decreasing biofilms, I like Exlear, which is yes. xylitol nasal spray, just to get rid of the biofilms and, and excess mm -hmm. sort of mucus in the nasal cavity. and using some colloidal silver nasal spray. I know that's not lungs, but again, we're talking about the whole respiratory tract and that's you know something else that a lot of our patients use with some success as well. And, and that's been helpful. Yeah, um, I know Scott and Ellen have, have done a lot of posts and written about coronavirus. And um, I wrote a huge long article on coronavirus. Um, if you haven't seen, we'll, I'll link those too. But I do talk about X-Clear and saline irrigation as one of the most important um, in uh, in prevention as well because you know with a lot of these viruses these respiratory viruses we know that they hello <laughs> I have a friend here um, a little face pop up right there <laughs> uh, these respiratory viruses will um, enter your nasal passages and start to multiply mm -hmm. and colonize and you know that's where we have this incubation period of you know multi multiplying enough so that then we develop 
symptoms. And, you know, if we can flush out any of those particles, these, those viral particles before they can take hold, I think it goes a long way in prevention. And I had a question on the blog about, well, some, they had read that some, someone had, uh, it was some researcher had posted that there was concern about pushing the virus further back in. Um, and there were, it was just interesting, but there were studies of patients who did daily nasal irrigation compared with uh, patients who didn't, you know, with saline, and found that those who did daily nasal irrigation had significantly fewer colds and flu-like illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it can be very beneficial. I mean, in the Ayurvedic tradition, you know, clearing your nasal passages with a neti pot uh, is a, yeah. is part of your daily hygiene, just like we brush our teeth, right? They brush their tongue and irrigate. Um, right. And then as far as homeopathics, um, I do use quite a bit of homeopathy and mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna, I just reach into my bag because um, one of the things that I do, pretty usually at the start of illness, now there is some um, thought that it could be used preventatively, but um, I don't know if you can see, but homeopathic, where's my camera? Axolococcin. <laughs> Axolococcin. That's my favorite. Mm -hmm. So um, Axolococcin, you know, one vial, um, the entire vial just, you, let it dissolve in your mouth, given three times over a 24 hour period um, at the start of any flu-like illness. And we know that for COVID-19, oftentimes it looks just like the flu at first right. um, and we just don't know. And so, but this has been found to significantly reduce the duration and severity of illness um, in, in some good studies. And so I do use that uh, quite a bit. Um, I've had questions about um, essential oils and I don't know if you can, I'm gonna turn my, See right back there, I have my diffuser going. <laughs> I, got my, I got some oils in my, um, you know, there, pile here, my oil. Oil. You know that oils, um, certain oils have been found in, in the research to have antiviral and antibacterial and antifungal benefits. So I'm not going to say you can use your oils to kill coronavirus and that's going to be it. But you know what? And when we don't know, right, when we don't have... Um, clear-cut guidance in conventional medicine. I mean, you pick up the paper and all it's, you read ever, there's no known treatment, there's no known cure. And then we just feel like sitting ducks, right? And we feel even more anxious. And so, you know, if, you know, with, with Scott and I and Ellen and I, I mean, we just really try to look at the evidence to show what could be helpful. So, I use my combination of, I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, on guard, um, which is, same as Thieves Oil, if you like Young Living, Elizabeth yeah. Van Buren is one of my favorites and they have a, an immune blend that's that's the same. So, um, but that has, there are some really beneficial oils. Cinnamon has, uh, is in there, really good antiviral properties. And then I dug into the research and yeah. tried to look at, are there any essential oils that we know could possibly be effective mm -hmm. against coronavirus? And so we know there are mm -hmm. lots of coronaviruses out there, but I'm talking in particular SARS. Right. right, you know, which is very similar to our current coronavirus that's spreading. That's why you'll see it in the news as SARS-CoV-2. Um, right. it's, it's the kind of second SARS-like virus to be around. Right. And there was one study, um, this was just one man, right? But in Munich, there's uh, they took the sputum of a man hospitalized with SARS and they used sage essential oil. Yeah. So that's why my sage, right, sage yeah. essential oil, and it inactivated the, the coronavirus in that, the SARS virus in that sputum. And so, I mean, I'm throwing, Sage is pretty strong. I just th throw a couple of drops into my um, into my diffuser. So, I mean, yeah, we just- gonna smell like pizza or something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's a really good word though. Um, you know, as physicians, we really try and be evidence-based and look at the literature. And, you know, unfortunately in times like this, I'm part of this emergency medicine um, List serve in an email, and I'm hearing a lot of people say, "Well, I would never try vitamin C, or I would never try that." There's no literature on it, and I really look at it and think, for a lot of these things, what are the downsides? And you know, we are resilient. We're resilient people in the face of this, and so we're going to try everything we can. And you know, the hardest working folks that we see in our practice are the parents of kids with pandas. Yeah. They research, they look, they learn, they try, and you know of harmful fault, I'm not going to discourage them from using an essential oil, even if there's no exact literature that's on right. it. These are general things that people can help. Well, and that's the thing too, right? This this virus was first described December 31, right? First report mm -hmm. 31 of 2019. That is less than three months ago. Of course, right. we don't have the literature because there just hasn't been enough time. But we do have literature from SARS, right? We right. do have literature 
from sepsis and right. multi-organ failure and uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So even though it's not specific to the current novel coronavirus, we can extrapolate some. And, and that's what I think we have to do, right? right? To really be able to understand how to support ourselves. And I really, you know, I put a ton of that research into the paper that I wrote because I want people to know what theoretically, I'm not, you know, recommending it as a cure, but we need to know what theoretically could right. maybe work. And I see some questions about, you know, Lomation. Lomatium is another amazing herb that maybe, maybe could have benefits. Um, so anyhow, we're just trying to really help help our patients understand what tools can we incorporate that are, as Scott said, um, not going to cause harm and may potentially have benefit, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so what if your child gets symptoms of COVID-19? What should they do? What about testing? I mean, we talked a little bit about testing, but but do you recommend kids, parents of kids with pans and pandas who are developing um, fever and cough, um, try to seek out testing? Well, that's a difficult question because in a lot of cases, you certainly would love to have a test that was negative <laughs> to make you feel better. Um, but at the same time, most likely, unless your child's sick, and if they're sick, they're going to end up at the hospital. But if they're not sick, it's not going to change a whole lot of what we do. Uh, the ERI just stopped working on getting emails from them as well, and they're getting kind of overrun with people with flu-like symptoms. In the vast majority of cases, it is the flu. And so currently our health department here is saying that people get a viral panel and a flu swab when they come in. If those are positive, then there's no further testing because they found the risk of having COVID along with something else is less, way less than 1%. Yeah. So they're kind of using that as a triage. Uh, as a triage algorithm, I think things are changing every day. And so our willingness to test uh, a lot of patients, as I said, are now being tested in almost, they're calling it drive-through testing at ERs where you, the car pulls up, you open the window and people are tested. It's tough. There aren't enough kits and the tests, if they're run through LabCorp and Quest can be as high as $1,600. Um, so that's tough to say whether it's a great recommendation. There are several algorithms out suggesting who gets tested. I think that what you had said, what we have covered during this time has been general things that we can do to both try and boost, bolster the immune yeah. system and respond like we would with almost any viral illness. So that's a tough question to, quite a tough question to answer. I know locally here, you know, even physicians that are requesting that their patients be tested, the, the health department's not doing it. So, you know, it's just not even an option unless your kid's really sick. I would say stay away from the testing facilities, to be honest with you. I mean, it's nice to know and maybe get that comfort, but I, we just don't have the resources to be able to do that at this point. In patient, in places where there are sick patients, you're much more likely to contract the virus. And that's why just going to an ER if to, for reassurance or if you have mild symptoms, it's not a great idea. In fact, a great number of patients in Wuhan where the virus started, we're infected waiting in line to be tested at a large medical facility. So just kind of food for thought. Yeah, yeah. You know, one thing that that I've, I've been telling patients is, you know, if we took coronavirus out of the picture right now, mm -hmm. if your child were to get sick with a fever, cough, runny nose, would you be going to the ER right now? And if the answer is no, then I would say out of the ER. Of course, as Scott had mentioned way in the beginning, if your child's having trouble breathing, you know, can't talk because they're gasping for air, any color changes around their mouth, then of course you're going to go because you need urgent medical care. But for right. the vast majority of times when your kids are sick with a cold or flu-like illness, you would likely not go to your doctor's office or ER. You kind of wait and see. And, and that's the same thing now because there are so many exposures. I mean, just last week, I saw a family of four. Every single one of them had influenza A. Um, the week before that, I saw you know several kids with influenza B. And so we we still are seeing a lot of flu going around. I saw a kid with RSV. I mean, there's, you know, there, there's just, you know, there's a lot going on. But um, just because your child has a, a fever and upper respiratory symptoms, doesn't mean that you necessarily have to go immediately get, to get tested. Um, I would say it's interesting. It's an interesting spin on it. You know it, that I don't know. I I, I, have, I think that on some level I might feel a little relieved if I actually did have COVID nineteen, just because then you know we can talk about some of the tools we might use if we were to get sick with it. But um, but if, if you could get it, have a milder illness and get over it, then you know okay, then I'm I'm fine. <laughs> And I do wonder um, how many of us have actually already had it, right? Mm -hmm. Just in milder form, because we, we really have not started testing in any significant degree to know 
how prevalent it is. And, and I'm sure there are many, many people out there who have had it and had it passed without even realizing it. Right. Absolutely. You know, we've been fighting viruses for thousands of years and we've won most of those battles. You know, yeah. and if you think of things in the past that have seemed really scary, we've come up with plans. We've come up with ways of dealing with it. Uh, and so we've, we're pretty resilient people. Now, what about, so if your child, you, if you had a patient, a mom calls you, dad calls you, okay, my kid has, well, you know, and I would say this would really be, I, for me, if your child has flu-like symptoms, it doesn't matter whether they have influenza or COVID-19, I'm gonna treat it the same initially, right? right. Um, but what, what do you recommend in terms of what, you know, what if they do get sick with COVID-19? Yeah, so again, it, say we don't know. It's probably very similar to what you say, Alicia. Alicia. Um, Elisa. So we hydrate, stay home, make sure your kid's hydrating, make sure your kid's uh, eating proper foods, make sure they're getting sleep, um, start the nutrients. If they're not already on the things that we just talked about, I mean, I do. we do use a lot of oxalococcinum. Um, and you know vitamin c for sure all the nutrients that we just talked about and you know it's not going to change the management for us and that was one of those questions you know i'm not sure we want to get into it but you know that whole anti-inflammatory piece of it you know when if do you give those things mm -hmm. i mean fever has been shown to fight infection so again we recommend for our kids and our adults like let the fever run its course, right? Absolutely. So as well as you can tolerate a fever, you know, you should allow that fever to run its course. And again, being ER docs, all of those things, we don't wanna discourage people from going to the ER if they need to go to the ER. You absolutely should go if you if you need to go. Yeah, and right. those things would be, you know, you're not breathing well, your respiratory rate is really fast, you're not able to tolerate anything orally, you know, having massive, vomiting and or diarrhea and you're so dehydrated you know any of those things would warrant going to the emergency department but all the basic things that you would normally do for cough cold flu those are the things you should be doing it doesn't change dramatically because it's COVID-19 that's right that's right and I remember Elisa at one of our conferences you'd shown us an acupressure point near the thumb for fever that you like to recommend yep. and I, yep. I'd love it if you would show that again. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I think this is, you know, I I'm, I'm love uh, knowing that, you know, two of the doctors that I respect the most in the whole wide world that we're so on the same page with, <laughs> you know, with all these things. Um, and so it's true. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're sick, I mean, I absolutely, you can up your glutathione that you're already taking. Hopefully you can up your vitamin C. We didn't really talk about vitamin A, but vitamin A does have some right. great viral properties. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what you can add on. Um, many of your kids are already on curcumin, right? As it, as an anti-inflammatory, right. um, but curcumin has been found to possibly reduce, um, the, the risks for sepsis. So, I mean, if, if you're, they're not already on curcumin, I think that would be a good thing to do. Um, I, you know, as far as the, uh, there was a question on the NSAIDs and we, we were going to get to that, right? So and and black like, elderberry, which we right. use, we that's use right. it, we recommend it. There's yeah. Yeah. viral studies out there for that. So, you know, we yeah. use it so we know better and otherwise in the acute phase, we absolutely are, are suggesting people use it. Yeah. And, you know, elderberry. So let's, let's tackle elderberry first. Okay. Because yeah. There's so much information online right now, um, back and forth, back and forth, right? <laughs> um, yeah, and I think it's a really important question because people are afraid to use elderberry and some people aren't and maybe use it every day. Um, elderberry or um, Sambucus, you might see mm -hmm. it as, right? Sambucus nigra, it's this particular black elderberry. Um, mm -hmm. What's really interesting was that there was one form of Sambucus um, it's not Sambucus nigra, it's a completely different Sambucus that you can't find commercially, but that actually was found to have some coronavirus activity. Now, mm -hmm. that being said, we don't have that available. So I don't know if black elderberry is going to have right. effects, but, um, you know, everyone's worried about the cytokine storm. And what are cytokines, right? We have inflammatory cytokines and we have anti-inflammatory cytokines, and they both have their role in mm -hmm. illness and and initially we want those inflammatory cytokines and then eventually we want those anti-inflammatory cytokines. Right. Um, is, uh, and so elderberry can do both. Elderberry can, can stimulate anti-inflammatory cytokines 
TNF alpha is one that's being, you know, talked about in, in a lot of posts, but also a lot of anti-inflammatory cytokines. And so, um, and I have found zero, zero evidence in the literature. And I've combed the literature. In fact, I'm writing a blog post just on elderberry, but I've combed the literature trying to find any evidence that elderberry indeed contributes and causes cytokine storm. And I found zero. So if anybody has that, I would please, please ask you to share it with us because what, what yeah. we want to do is really provide evidence-based information to the extent possible. Now, I also tell families that, you know, when we talk about evidence-based medicine, because I think that is, um, it is important, but it's also a way that many people will say, oh, there's no, no evidence, right? Evidence-based medicine incorporates clinical experience. And right. Right. right? Yeah. It's not just what's in the literature because we know that the research lags well behind what we're seeing in clinical practice and so there is truly the art and science of medicine and so i will tell you for you know the the 15 years that i've had this integrative practice integrative functional medicine practice and using elderberry you know all the time i have never seen a child on elderberry have a flare in their autoimmune symptoms now no. everyone is different we we are our own experiments Right? right. And so, you know, you have to listen to your child's body. Um, but for the moment, I'm not really recommending elderberry daily as a preventive. Exactly. Um, but I but I am recommending, as Ellen said, as as um, you know, when you get acutely sick, uh, yeah. because there just have been found so many um, reports and research papers on the uh, on the um, on the benefits. Right. Um, now, NSAIDs, right, ibuprofen, a lot of our kids are on ibuprofen or naproxen. Um, or we're using it to control flares. Um, there was, again, that one, uh, I think he yeah. was the deputy of health, but in France, that one post now is taking hold and people are saying, don't use ibuprofen, um, use acetaminophen. Now, again, I, you know, I don't, if we're presuming that the quote, cytokine storm and the worsening is similar to what happens in some patients with influenza, I mean, there's been no research correlating ibuprofen and yeah. said use with sepsis and other viral illnesses. Um, so I, I would hesitate to take ibuprofen off the table when there's just one remark made. Um, we also know, uh, you know, I, I would really hesitate to swap it out for acetaminophen because right. acetaminophen sure. is glutathione, right? right. We just said before yeah. was our master antioxidant. So, um, so for the moment, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm guessing you would agree, I'm not taking and and sets off yeah. the table for our kids with pain there's just not enough information out there for sure and you know we're usually using it for a relatively short period of time during a flare and or you know if someone's really uncomfortable with a fever and really can't tolerate it for some reason so again these are short periods of time these aren't extended periods of time and and we don't know but again we're not basing our recommendations to people based off one statement that's been made yeah. and certainly Tylenol acetaminophen is not our no. drug no. of choice to go to. Yeah, right. We are optimizing detoxification all the time as part of our protocols. We absolutely don't want to reduce our ability to detox through our primary organ of detoxification by giving acetaminophen. So, so it's not an option. The um, And just that whole elderberry acetaminophen or uh, Tylenol, uh, I'm sorry, ibuprofen, these controversies that are coming up, if you look at the way that the posts are written, it's usually on social media and they're usually super urgent, almost inflammatory. The posts about elderberry have said, you know, if you do this, it will cause a fatal cytokine storm, which will cause liver and kidney failure. And it, it just may, takes people aback and they get really yeah. shocked. I would say yeah. most of the part, you know, when you hear us communicate with our patients or our followers, same thing with with Dr. Song, when you hear people communicate in a way that is really alarming like that, it, it usually the message is not correct. <laughs> There's either not enough evidence, and I don't know why people do that. It's it's almost fear mongering, and I think it's harmful. It really gets people stirred up. You know, um, one of the things I've thought a, a lot about in the last two days is if you think about Pearl Harbor in 1941, we were attacked by someone, and there was no reason we would believe that we would have won the, the Second World War. We weren't prepared for it. Uh, Japan was decimating the entire Pacific theater and should have, could have just taken us over. And the first thing that Franklin Roosevelt said on the radio was, we have nothing to fear except fear itself. The very first thing. So, you know, I would encourage you, if you find something that's really troubling, contact someone 
uh, contact someone that you trust, your pediatrician, uh, to kind of put it in context for you. And so that's certainly something we don't mind doing for our patients, and we like to answer questions and kind of calm people's fears. It's very rare. Um, you know, I was in emergency medicine for 27 years, and someone once said there are very few jump over the counter emergencies in emergency medicine. It's true. Uh, you know, you, you've got to keep it together yourself yeah. when you have a resuscitation. Yeah. So people are counting on you. Um, so, so let's see, Mary, Susan just asked if I showed the acupressure point. No, and I'm sorry, I get I can uh, get distracted and run on. <laughs> but, I, so love that we're, I love that we're talking about the same things and doing the same things because earlier today, I'm searching up all the new stuff on Sambucus because everybody's out there. My patients are asking me and I love that we're, you know, on the same page. It just is, it's so nice to have yeah, you with yeah. us. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So the two acupressure points, um, because I, I like to teach. So the patients in my office and, and, you know, online, you know, through the healthy kids, happy kids work, I try to teach parents, um, everything that I do for my own kids when they're sick and also, um, you know, what I, what I do in the office. And so, you know, different herbs and home homeopathic medicines and acupressure points to use. And so there are two acupressure points when your kids are sick. Now there was one comment by Cindy that, um, Pan's kids often don't get fever, but still can have COVID. And that's true, right? You know, but you know, same thing with um, kids on the autism spectrum, they rarely mount fevers. And oftentimes parents right. they never get sick, which is also not necessarily a sign of a healthy immune response, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, does that mean higher risks for COVID? No, it just, it means a different immune response to so supporting their mm -hmm. immune systems like we've been talking about. Um, but if kids do have an infection or a fever, doesn't have to just be fever, but there's two points. The first point is um, on the back of the hand. I'm going to try to get the camera lined up. <laughs> back of the hand, in the web space between your thumb and your index finger. And this point, you can massage really firmly. Um, it's good for headaches. It's good for fevers. It's good for constipation. <laughs> it's um, it's really good for getting whatever out that you don't want. <laughs> and then uh, the other point is uh, I have to sit up here a little bit. Is on your elbow crease. So if you um, bend your elbow, I'm going to lift up, bend your elbow, like make a muscle, right? Bend, it, bend your elbow. And then in your elbow crease, you'll see just right outside your elbow crease. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's another point. So this point is called large intestine 11. Okay. This point. <laughs> <laughs> it's called a large intestine four. Okay. Mm -hmm. so you can look those up large intestine four, large intestine 11. Those are two of the most potent, um, acupressure points when your kids are sick or when you're sick. And I also like to rub essential oils into those points. Um, lavender is a very gentle essential oil that can be used topically. Um, you can actually use it, quote, neat, meaning you don't have to dilute it. Right. A lot of the oils you do want to dilute because they can be really irritating to the skin. But lavender, you know, when, when we're sick, when our kids are sick, anxieties run high. So lavender, of course, can help with that calming, but also has its own anti-inflammatory benefits, right? Yeah. And and um, and can even help reduce fevers. Uh, and this point itself, you know, large intestine four uh, has been found to also be an antipyretic point, meaning reducing fevers. Now, it's very different, though, than using ibuprofen or acetaminophen for fevers, because these points and lavender, they're not going to suppress the fever. They're not suppressing your body's um, natural response to infection. They're just Great. supporting your body's immune system so that um, the fever will, um, the, the time to be well is kind of compressed. Right. Sure. Yeah. Great. I love lavender. I'll just tell you a quick aside. My son went on a mission trip and came back with his entire back, like second degree sunburn from oh, being no. in the Dominican or whatever. And I rubbed, I mean, he had blisters all over, rubbed lavender all over his back and um, woke up the next day and was like perfectly fine. It was amazing. Nice. Yeah. I mean, it really, you know, we think of oils and many families use oils and many moms are using oils and, you know, yes, they smell great, but but many of them do actually have such great therapeutic benefit. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to point out Megan Odson. She wrote, um, and I love this, that uh, she wrote the zinc dosing her, her pediatrician, Pejman Katarai, which who Ellen and I know, uh, Ellen Scott and I know really well. He was group last year and, and he's awesome. He's in Santa Monica. Um, but this would, he just wrote down the suggested zinc dosage and, uh, and she shared that um, graciously. And then also for um, 
uh, Sambucus nigra. So mm -hmm. and actually Pejman, I mean, he, he is, he's a pediatrician, but mm -hmm. he's also an herbalist and a gemotherapy expert. So right. an essential oil expert. So he's such a great resource. And um, in fact, that reminds me, I should get him on line too. To, <laughs> to talk to him. Um, okay. So any, I'm just going to scroll through any other questions and then um, Scott and Ellen, is there anything else, you know, Oh, let's talk about flares, right? Let's talk about if our kids um, do get, whether it's COVID-19 or, or influenza, right? They both, uh, we're seeing that right now and similar symptoms and we may not be sure, but you know, what if our kids are starting to flare? What would we do? Um, you know, for a lot of our kids, we, we're using that, you know, short three to five day um, prednisone burst, just like we would with a, a kid with an asthma flare. So, um, and knowing that prednisone may not be the best thing in terms of sepsis, um, you know, what would you tell our, our families listening? I think it's hard to, you know, the, like anything else, we don't have any uh, concrete uh, proof of, of any adverse outcomes with prednisone. Uh, there's actually some positive studies for high dose IV vitamin C and IV uh, steroids in patients in the ICU, adult patients in the ICU with sepsis. So it's really difficult to tell. Like anything else, I think it's a risk benefit. I would be more likely to use ibuprofen initially than uh, prednisone, but, you know, really pans and pandas care. Uh, sometimes can be any port in a storm. You're really trying the best you can to control behavior, make sure the child doesn't harm themselves or others, and trying to get them to a point of recovery. So I wouldn't definitely rule out using uh, steroids or NSAIDs or whatever you needed to use or treating any other infections like we always would, right? Identifying other things, strep throat, perianal strep, yeah. strep around the bottom. Uh, anything like that would yeah. go on and treat. So I think those are important things. We would treat largely the, the same, I think, during a flare. And then obviously yeah. the other things you mentioned, cognitive behavioral therapy, essential oils, uh, weighted blanket, uh, yeah. bath, I think we yeah. talked about magnesium baths with lavender, things like that to calm them down. So uh, most parents have gotten quite used to how to calm down their child in the midst of a flare, but a lot of those things can be really helpful. And uh, Dr. Allen just did a, um, a Facebook Live with Roseanne Papanahaj, Dr. Roseanne, uh, on pans and pandas. And actually, it was a great, uh, it was similar to the one you did, Lisa, with how to talk to your children through unpleasant feelings associated with this coronavirus. So, And I would say on that, you know, one of the things that our patients should have should be a flare strategy plan. Like, we don't want to wait till they flare to then say, oh, what do we do, right? So, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. figure out what works for your kid if you, you know, for your child if you can, and start working on a strategy now so that we're not waiting until they're in a flare and then, you know, kind of in crisis mode. And and I, I do agree with Scott that everything we do, adult, child, whatever, there's always a risk benefit ratio, particularly because we, there aren't as many studies out there for those things. So we're trying to make the most informed, best decisions for our patients. Um, but, you know, Sometimes it's trial and error, to be honest, and we try things with the best intention to see if we can get the best results for as short a period of time, especially if we're having to prescribe a medication. Yeah, I love that you said fi find out what works best for your child, right? right? Because, you know, for any kid with pans and pandas, I mean, it's it's not at all a one size fits all approach. Right. So, right. Um, you know, for, for one child, you know, ibuprofen may work for another child, it may be curcumin. Right. Um, I would also, you know, I mentioned the SPMs, specialized pro-resolving mediators. I think that could be a really good choice. So just having those in your arsenal, um, you know, and and Boswellia too, Elisa. Do you use Boswellia? I don't use Boswellia often, but um, but have you had? I, there are yeah, some really I mean, good studies with Boswellia and actually and sepsis too. Right. So Boswellia, you know, is frankincense um, from frankincense, and I, I do. I do really find it to be very helpful. Curcumin in some people can cause some GI upset and yeah. a little bit of reflux stuff. So, um, you know, gastritis. So if they already struggle with that, then I tend to recommend Boswellia. It's just another good anti-inflammatory option. Um, so something else to put in that arsenal of choices. I, I saw a question just a few minutes ago too that I think was a great question, which was... <laughs> Sorry. <talking. laughs> I don't know who. Yes. Uh, we were laughing. <laughs> yeah. that got oh I'm like, well, did, you did you see the jealousy, the cute tiger stuff? I'm like, what tiger? I don't see one behind me. Right. So maybe uh -huh. there's one behind me. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's so, so funny. 
Uh, someone had mentioned, you know, are any of these things good for parents as well? And they certainly are. These are some of the same approaches we would use in adults. And I think that's really important because parents of kids with pans and pandas tend to not care for themselves. And self-care is really important. Yeah. It's hard yeah. to care for your child if you're not healthy yourself. So, yeah, put the oxygen on yourself first absolutely. before you try to give it. Yeah, um, sure. I want to just a couple of things too. That there's been two questions about windbreaker because windbreaker is a Chinese herbal formula that I, I use at mm -hmm. the onset of any fever or viral illness. Um, I, you know, I, I've told many people um, that I travel with an eight ounce bottle <laughs> wherever I go. I gotta go anywhere without it, uh, and it's the first thing I'll give my kids at the sign of that kind of glassy eyed look. Um, it is mm -hmm. not. There were reports initially of a Chinese herbal formula. Um, Shang Huan Lian, I believe it was that uh, that some some of the researchers in China found to be um, helpful. I don't know. I don't know if there was enough research to say yes, you got it, and you know there's stockpiling of it. <laughs> um, but I do know that windbreaker works amazingly well for flu and flu-like illnesses. So that is my first one of my go tos for sure. And then there was a question about other antivirals. Do you guys incorporate any other antivirals um, like olive leaf extract or oil yeah. of oregano? We, sure. we've, well, I want to ask you, hey, buddy, <laughs> where do you get your windbreaker? So windbreaker is by a company called Con K-A-N Herbs. They're just right here in Scotts Valley near me. That's by Santa Cruz, um, Carmel, our, our Carmel, not your Carmel. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, um, but I do believe it has to be a purchaser practitioner. I mean, we do have it in our office, but I know many acupuncturists carry it as well. I was gonna get. I was gonna pull up. We've got a immune support product that has several different ingredients in it besides the, you know, black elderberry. But I love products that have like olive leaf extract. Mm -hmm. Even um, we use echinacea in typical sort of uh, acute uh, immune support type stuff. Uh, Monolaurin. Monolaurin. Lysine yeah. has been shown to be antiviral. We don't know that it has any effectiveness for this. Um, yeah, I mean, I also like biocidin. Um, so, you know, yeah. I tend to use that yeah. when people have, um, you know, an acute uh, viral and or bacterial illness. So, you know, it's got a lot of nice herbs. And we, you know, again, there's so many different er herbal companies and protocols out there. It's hard to know which are best, but, you know, we find the ones, again, you find the ones that really tend to work for you. And those are the ones that we typically recommend. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and as, as Scott had mentioned way in the beginning, it's um, that um, we want to be cautious of some of the things that we're reading online, right? The blogs and the posts um, claiming that certain herbs or certain supplements will be effective in treating or preventing or killing coronavirus, the right. COVID-19, because we, I mean, there's absolutely no yeah. truth to that because we don't know. Again, I mean, all these antivirals, I mean, we know that they do really help and, and can be uh, beneficial for flu-like syndromes and other mm -hmm. viral infections. And, and that's where we're just trying to give mm -hmm. more information so that you can you can have some more tools, not feel like you're helpless and just have to sit at home doing nothing. Um, but but you know, just know that we don't know if they will work. But I do know, for instance, you know, olive leaf extract, once we started adding that to our arsenal, I mean our our colds and flus um, are so much better and windbreaker really yeah. is my go to. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Um, there was a, there was a question here. Oh, so Cindy wrote cat's claw. Cat's claw can be another one. Mm -hmm. um, Becky Windbreaker is a Chinese herbal combination. Uh, it's just it's by Con Herbs. It's called Wind. The reason why it's called Windbreaker because I know it's kind of a funny name. <laughs> but in Chinese medicine, when you get a fever or any an infection, um, uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, it's called it's considered an attack of wind cold or wind heat. And so the wind, right? The wind is attacking you. And so you want to break the wind, not in the sense that we're used to <laughs> talking about, but in the traditional Chinese sense, right? <laughs> um, and then um, where to find uh, doctors Ellen and Scott Antoine. So on Facebook, you want to you wanna go to Healing Pans and Pandas. Okay, so uh, search on top. I'm gonna put all these links too when we're done. This is the recording will be up on my Facebook page, and you can share it. I'm gonna put all of the links to find Scott and Ellen, but their Facebook page is Healing Pans and Pandas. On Instagram, they're the Pandas Docs, and their website is www.vinehealthcare.com. So I'll be sure to have all of their links up there. Um, I'll link to my article on a um, couple of things. My article on 
uh, that huge long article I wrote on coronavirus uh, as a resource. Okay. Um, there, I do have a post on essential oils and making your own hand sanitizer. So I'll just put all those there for you guys. Um, so you have those as a resource. One of the other things I just wanted to mention is we are, we've started a um, healing pans and pandas support group, particularly during this time where um, we'll give you that link, Elisa, and you can include that yeah, as well. Sure. Just to be able to provide things as they um, develop, we'll um, provide what we know and uh, continue to give information in there. And, and especially in this time of social isolation, you know, it's really hard as a pan's mom and pan's parents, we're already re feeling really isolated already, um, most of the time before, you know, COVID-19. And so we wanna make sure that um, those of you that are, are home with your kids, that you feel like you're well supported and have a place to really be able to connect with one another. And we hope to use that support group to be able to do that. So we'll, we'll provide you with that link afterwards and you can include that there. Oh yeah, I definitely will. Okay. So I, what, what we're going to do, it's been, um, oh, let's see, Angela's here, Dr. Angela Knapp. So she wrote, there's research on coronavirus, SARS and multiple botanicals. Um, on datapunk.net. And I put in some of the, the research on, in my paper on quercetin. Um, garlic, of course, is I great. Love that. Yeah, too, yeah. Yeah, yeah, quercetin is great. Um, so thank you, Angela. Uh, I'll go through here and see if there's any questions that we haven't answered. I know we've been on here a long time and um, you guys have stayed with us for so long. So thank you so much. And you know, I'm glad we just literally, Scott, Ellen, and I, was it last night, right? Last like, night. Yeah. You know, Six o'clock at night, we're like, let's do this tomorrow. <laughs> so we put it together and it worked. This is my first time streaming through Live, and it looks like it worked fine. So yeah. um, again, I'll, I'll have this up on the Facebook page. Um, I think the, the kids are getting restless. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we'll, um, we'll see you guys soon. All the links are gonna be up there. Be sure to um, follow Scott and Ellen on their Healing Pans and Pandas Facebook page. Be sure to join their Pans and Pandas support group that's going to be through the Healing Pans and Pandas Facebook page. Um, and so we'll have all those links for you guys, okay? Awesome. All right. Thanks, Elisa. Bye. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks. Bye. Stay healthy.